Our next endemic or systemic mycosis that we're going to talk about is coccidioide mycosis. So this one, as you can see from the map of the U.S., affects our area. This is a um, west coast, desert southwest fungal infection. There are a couple of different species associated with causing the infection, Coccidioides imidis and Coccidioides posidasi. We see imidis in California, the other species everywhere else, and we really don't see much of a difference between um, what the fungi look like, depending on the species, it doesn't really matter, or the pathogenicity. They're both pretty equal in terms of the disease they cause and the severity of disease. When we kind of break it down even more into a county by county map, of course, here's Fresno County. Um, we see really high incidence of this infection in California in Kern County, so Bakersfield area. Um, and we see really high incidence in southwestern Arizona. So this is a local fungal infection. And in fact, the disease is called San Joaquin Valley Fever. As we saw with blastomycosis, it's a disease that we see following inhalation of spores. So this is another reason why it's really important that you take classes like ecology and you understand um, drought and wet cycles because what we see with coccidioides infections is that when we have a really wet winter like we just had the fungus can grow very very well in the soil then when we have a hot dry summer which we always tend to have the spores aerosolize and because there are so many of them following that really wet winter, they aerosolize in the hot, dry summer and then get inhaled. And we really tend to see this infection at super high levels in people who work outdoors, particularly farm workers. So again, it's, it's important that you understand the ecology because let's say you're a public health professional or an infectious disease specialist in Fresno County, in Kern County, in southwestern Arizona, you're probably going, oh man, we're going to see a lot of coccidioides this summer. And you're probably right. So what happens is the inhaled spore form will convert to these structures called spherules in the lungs. So you can see that um, through the tissue. The spherules will produce structures called endospores through progress progressive cleavage. And that's like these little things on the inside, but these are different from bacterial endospores. And then the released endospores will produce new spherules. And so you basically have a spreading of this. And eventually what you can get are cavities in the lungs because of the damage caused by the spherules, caused by the immune system. And these cavities, if you actually look at them, you'll start to see hyphae, um, and other fungal structures within the lungs. So the exposure to the infection is greatest in the summer and fall when it's dusty and hot. And of course, cycles of rain and drought are what perpetuate the spread. So this is a headline from 2017. In Kern County alone, Valley Fever killed six people and infected at least 1,900. That's a lot. For a fungal infection that sometimes people, this might be the first time you've ever heard of this. And it's actually a super common fungal infection in this area. The infection rates can be as high as anywhere from 16 to 42% by early adulthood in endemic areas. So that would include Fresno County, um, Kern County, right? These areas in central California, the desert Southwest. Overall, the incidence of infection is about 15 per 100,000 per year, but we do see higher numbers in patients who are elderly and who are HIV positive. And of course, these numbers might actually be even higher, but we're talking about what's reported to the public health department. So here are the overall numbers. The most recent data I could find uh, were a summary of, from 2019. 
So in the US, there were 20,000 cases of Valley fever that were reported. Um, 9,000 of those were in California. So if you look at the graph, California is in blue. Arizona had a few more. I think Arizona was closer to 10,000, but you know, you see for the most part, California and Arizona um, in recent years have been running pretty close together. Um, Nevada, New Mexico, and Utah are kind of grouped together as this um, green line, and then other states, Texas, Washington, Oregon, are, are in purple. But so California is, is generally the second highest incidence or number of cases of valley fever every year. And Arizona is usually first. So if you're gonna practice medicine in these areas, or you're perhaps going to be a clinical laboratory scientist in these areas, this is what you have to consider. Of the fungal infections we're gonna talk about, this is the most virulent. So of course it's the one that we have in our area, right? We can't have blastomycosis, which is less virulent, or histoplasmosis, which is less virulent. No, no, we have to have coccidioides, which is the most virulent. And part of that is because um, you need to inhale very few of the spore structure in order to produce infection. However, about 60% of patients um, will be asymptomatic. They'll have an asymptomatic pulmonary infection. Some may have a self-limited flu-like illness, um, and upwards of 10% of people can actually have an allergic response to this um, fungal infection. So this is like, I see it more, or I saw it more when I lived in Texas, they would do like an allergen report on the news because everything in Texas is trying to kill you apparently. Um, but you know, cedar, mold, right? This is kind of the stuff that they're talking about for allergies. So some patients may have an allergic reaction. You do, however, mount a specific immune response to reinfection. So once you've been infected, it's unlikely that you would be reinfected. Now, patients can develop like a secondary type of infection, which I guess we would also call like a chronic type of infection when the infection lasts longer than six weeks. Um, and in those patients, we can see things like progressive pulmonary disease um, or single or multi-system dissemination. And once the disease has disseminated, so once the fungus has gotten out of the lungs and gone other places in the body without treatment, the mortality rate is like 90%. So again, this is a very virulent fungal infection. Uh, here we've got some of our risk factors. Um, as you might imagine, you know, people who are young or very old, um, there are, it does seem that there are some um, like genetic predispositions depending on ethnicity. Uh, pregnancy, of course, puts you at risk for things. And if you have a depressed cell mediated immunity. Diagnosis is through histopathology of tissues. You can do culture, but it's not preferred because it is highly infectious. Uh, and of course, serology. This, um, unlike blastomycosis, it's easier to diagnose coccidioides infections uh, through serology. Most individuals are gonna be asymptomatic. Uh, they won't require treatment, but some will. Uh, patients who are pregnant or in postpartum period should be treated with amphotericin B uh, because again, there is a high risk to the patient. We'll try the riskier therapy. People who are immune compromised should be treated with amphotericin B and azoles for at least one year. So these are not, you know, you take your two weeks of antibiotics and you're done. For some of these endemic fungal infections, we're talking months, years of therapy. Patients with chronic pneumonia should be treated with azoles for at least one year. Patients who developed meningeal symptoms, so like meningitis, should be treated with fluconazole indefinitely. It's tricky for the immune system to get in there and clear these types of infections. So, you know, you've gotta be on drugs basically for the rest of your life. There is a vaccine in development for dogs that should be on the market uh, hopefully next year. It is thought that it will be more than eight years though 
for the human vaccine to be uh, available. Here is um, an infograph I found that was printed a few years back about the life cycle of valley fever. Of course, you can look at this at your convenience. Um, you know, groups at high risk, pregnant women, African Americans, and Filipinos. Again, it just tends to be that genetic susceptibility. Uh, patients who are immune compromised, diabetics, people with organ transplants, people undergoing uh, steroid therapy. Here are some of the symptoms. They, a lot of them seem very nonspecific, so it can be hard to determine what you've actually got. Um, and again, this is how the uh, infection works. So these are some headlines I've pulled just out of, um, you know, California media. New law requires construction companies to provide valley fever training. So construction workers are at high risk. They're disturbing the soil as they're building homes or build, you know, other buildings. Uh, more than a thousand Californians are hospitalized every year. Climate change, how that might affect the increase um, in incidents here, but also the spread. They're thinking that within the next 75 years, coccidioides will spread to the Midwest and Canada. Um, and actually you can see, so in 2007, this is where the fungus was endemic. In 2035, it's predicted to be here, 2065, 2095. So again, with the climate warming, scientists are predicting its range will expand. 